Fantastic. So we've just got everyone coming in now. Um, we'll give you a minute or so just to get set up. If you want to turn your video on, please feel free to. We'll keep our um, microphones off for this session um, until the Q&A. But if you want to pop those on, it's nice to see your faces. Um, so let's jump in. Welcome, everyone. Um, to our fireside chat. Um, today we're going to be unpacking fats, a deep dive into fats for metabolic health. My name's Charlotte and I'm the accredited practicing dietitian here at Vively. Um, firstly, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past and present. Today we are joined by Dr. Joanna McMillan. Joanna is an accredited practicing dietitian, PhD nutrition scientist, author, TEDx speaker, TV and radio speaker. And Jo, I'm so excited to have you to join us today. Um, we're also joined by Dr. Michelle Woolhouse. Michelle is an integrative GP, keynote speaker, author, and of course our medical director here at Vibley. Now, as I mentioned, if you're comfortable, please feel free to pop your video on. It's really nice to be able to connect faces um, to the people that I'm chatting to on the app. Um, and if you've got any questions, pop them in um, in the chat section and we'll get to those in our Q&A section at the end as well. Um, for those that can't make it, we'll be recording this and we can send a link out afterwards. Um, so Michelle, I'm going to hand over to you to start our deep dive into fats. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the fireside chat for this afternoon. Joe, so nice to see you again and speak with you again. And thank you so much for all the work that you do and, and all of the, um, the really science-based uh, nutrition work that you really try and like kind of, um, I guess, distill for all of us. So it's just so exciting to have you here today. Thanks and sure. we wanted to really kind mm. of do a bit of a deep dive into fats, you know, so Let's face it, you know, it's been more than several decades where fats have been demonised from a dietary perspective. And I still think that despite a lot of really good communication about fats, there still really is a mixed message about fats. And I was thinking about it as I was putting some of these questions together today, <laughs> thinking, you know, gee, fats are just, you know, there's good fats, there's bad fats, there's brown fats, there's white fats, there's omega-3 fats, six, zero, nine, you know, saturated fats, unsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats. It, you know, no wonder people are really confused about, you know, fat, whether it's good, bad, and all of this kind of information. So let's start with the basics. I'm going to pick yeah. your brain over the next little while. What are fats? And what do they do and how do they impact our, our metabolic health? Well, I think the first thing to understand is, is the difference between um, the fats that are in our diet and then there's the fats that are in our body. And, and the first thing to remember about fats in our body is that they actually have a really important function. So we're never trying to aim for no fat in the body whatsoever. You know, athletes might get down to an extremely low um, body fat percentage, but actually fat has a function in our body. So it's of course a store of energy and it's a very effective store of energy. So even if you're reasonably lean, um, you know, you've still got quite a lot of fat there, which would last us for a very, very long time. So although we can't do without water for very long, the reason that we can do without food for quite a long time is, is because of this ability to store a lot of energy in our fat stores. Mm -hmm. But it also acts as uh, fats have functions in the body. So cholesterol, for example, is one of, of the fats um, in the body that actually Actually has a function in terms of being um, essential for the production of particular uh, uh, hormones in the body to being, uh, you know, a function of every single cell. So the first thing to understand is, you know, the idea that all fat is bad is, is really rather silly when you mm. think about the, these various roles for fat within the body. Then when we look at the diet, then fat comes in a whole load of different forms. And one of the reasons why research has got confused, let alone the public. Research has got confused and thinks the messaging has changed over time because there's been this realization that it's not just the type of fat, and you mentioned saturated fat, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, these are the sort of fat families that we can talk more about. But not only is there differences between those fat families, but it also matters 
uh, about the food that those fats are present in and what else is there. So we're now starting to use this term, the food matrix, and dairy is a really good example of this, that dairy foods have a very particular food matrix that actually, although they contain lots of saturated fats, in fact, those saturated fats act very, very differently in our body compared to saturated fats present in other types of food. And that's why we've had this change in, in the information that there is and you know, heart foundations and other institutions around the world have quite recently updated uh, their guidelines to say actually full fat dairy is not increasing your risk of heart disease. It's either neutral and some studies even showing that it can be beneficial. Mm -hmm. And that's because of this matrix. So, you know, we're not eating fat in isolation very often. You're usually eating fat as part of a whole food or, or as part of a meal where the fat is then uh, mixing with all sorts of other ingredients, both chemicals that make up the foods themselves and other whole foods. And that's what's really important to remember. So sometimes it's good to drill down into looking at the individual fat families or even individual fatty acids themselves. But sometimes we also need to step back and look at the bigger picture and actually look at the impact of whole foods on our health. And that often gives us, and the food combinations that we eat, and that often gives us a much better picture. Mm, wow. So, I mean, it's such a good way to look at it like fat families, because I guess like all family members, there can be good ones and bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we can all relate to that. <laughs> So we also talk about like things like essential fats and non-essential fats. And I think that's also a really important thing from a disease prevention perspective. Um, a lot of information about the importance of omega-3 fatty acids. Could, yeah. So can you tell us through, you know, talk us through the definitions of what an essential fat is and, and obviously, you know, how they impact um, or, or what their impact is on the role of the body and the role of disease. And then also some of the non-essential fats. Um, as well well fat there actually are only two truly essential fatty acids and what that really means is that these are fats that we cannot make in our bodies we need to get them in our diet but we need them in very very tiny amounts so it's not really very difficult to get those but you quite correctly mentioned the omega-3s and they are arguably also essential but only as the very uh the long chain omega-3s because we have a very limited capacity to make them in the body so i would certainly be on the side of of saying that these are essential to get in your diet because we're not very good and there's some genetic differences between us i've had my own genes tested i know i'm not very good at making long chain omega-3s from the plant omega-3 the ala that we get in things like chia and flaxseed and so on so i know that my genetic variation is such that i'm not good at making my long chain omega-3s so i need to make sure that i'm getting them in my diet so i make sure that i'm eating oily fish i make sure that i'm eating things like eggs and and you can get some of these omega-3s in and in, in things like meat so, or you have to take a supplement. So things like that are worthwhile knowing, particularly if you're following a plant-based diet or you're not eating very many animal foods at all. And certainly if you're not eating things like oily fish, which is our main source of those long chain omega-3s, you need to be aware of those kinds of things. All of the other fats, really, we can make them in our own bodies. So all of the saturated fats, for example, we can make in our body. We don't need to have those, those um, fats in our diet. But what we then need to understand is that different types of fats do influence metabolism. Some of them are more strongly, the saturated fats, for example, are more associated with more visceral fat. And that's the fat around the middle that we really don't want to have too much of. We know that, that some of those saturated fats in particular are much more likely to raise your cholesterol now not in everybody so if your cholesterol is genetically fairly low or, or healthy um, then th that may not be something that you need to worry about so I think the other thing to understand and that's what's so good about some of the work that you're doing with Vively is really trying to individualize mm -hmm. dietary approaches and that's what we need to understand when it comes to all sorts of aspects in our diet including fats that mm -hmm. fats may influence us all very differently and for some of us we have to pay more attention I gave the example for myself of the omega-3s um, I also know from a genetic perspective, I do very well and I'm, I'm likely to have better weight control with a higher monounsaturated fat diet. And again, that's a genetic variation. So I think the more we're starting to understand about the influence and the dynamics of genetics mixed with our environments and our, and our own um, individual dietary requirements, we start to get a much clearer picture of why it is that fats may affect us differently. Mm. You mentioned, you know, in, in that, you know, the, the role of visceral fat, which is something that, 
you know, is, is really important. And, and again, you know, at Vively, we can see sometimes people's sugars, you know, becoming, um, I guess, less flexible, you know, more problematic when there's a lot of visceral fat yeah. um, in the system. <clears throat> Tell us a little bit about what we need to know about visceral fat. I mean, obviously, you know, you know, we can sometimes see it, you know, as we gain mm. weight around the middle um, at various times as we increase weight, but some people don't actually visibly or, or not able to see their visceral fat visibly so some people stay yeah. quite thin and can still have visceral fat so let's talk a little bit about the importance of visceral fat is it ever you know how much is okay is it ever okay you know what do we need to know about that yeah so visceral fat what's what's really important to understand is that this isn't the fat that we can pinch around our waist it's actually the fat that's around the internal organ. So it's under the muscle. And that's why you can get someone who appears to be quite lean, but they can have more visceral fat than they when they really understand. Excuse me, I've got a tickle in my throat. Um, <clears> throat> I've got the startings of a sore throat, and it's just making me cough a little. Um, so hopefully my voice will hold out. Yeah, so if I had someone the other day in the office say to me, oh, Joe, I've just had a DEXA scan. That's how you can measure your visceral fat. <laughs> she was extremely surprised to discover she's in fact got much more visceral fat and she's kind of quite a young lean girl so getting a DEXA scan is the best way to actually measure your visceral fat and that will give you the range that you want to try to get down to excuse me <laughs> take your time uh, Joe. take your time yeah, sorry I'm done now. just getting, when you get a frog in your throat and then you're trying to stop, it just makes it worse so yeah so the things that we know that influence visceral fat well one one of the best things that you can do is start exercising you've absolutely got to exercise and that's one of the key things that's going to help with your blood glucose control your cholesterol control and it will help you to start getting rid of some of that visceral fat so some of the uh there is mixed evidence around what evidence what, you know what exercise is best um i'm quite a fan of hit training i think hits can be quite an effective way of trying to get down your visceral fat and it's a very time efficient type of workout so that's high intensity interval training. So I do that at my local gym. There's a class on, on the indoor bikes and in the, the bike studio that's basically hit training on the bike. So, you know, we're in and out in 40 minutes and it's a very, very effective workout. So that might be something that, that um, it, you know, and you can that can be tailored towards your own level of fitness and the level of intensity that you require. But even just a daily walk and making sure that you're moving every single day can be extremely helpful. And then we know when it comes to diet, actually controlling your blood glucose levels by making sure you're cutting out the refined carbs and too much added sugar, not the natural sugars in your diet. Those are, are generally really good for us, but added sugars and refined carbs and I would be cutting down on your saturated fat other than dairy. So dairy does seem to, to act differently um, and making sure that you've got much healthier types of, of fat. So we know, you know, that I'm a big fan. I will just put my disclaimer and I am on the board for Cover Estate Olives. But I'm long been the reason I've become so involved with that company is because of my work in the area of, of fats and oils and in particular extra virgin olive oil. So we've got really good evidence around the fact that people who have a lot of extra virgin olive oil as, their, as the principal fat in their diet tend to have lower levels of, of visceral fat. So they have smaller waist circumferences and they're leaner overall. So influencing the types of fats in your diet and then paying attention to the quality of the carbohydrates can really help you to get that visceral fat down. Mm. I should mention though, that there is a genetic component there too. So, you know, I think it's always really um, important when we talk about diet, exercise, and lifestyle interventions to just remember that you you are layering that on over your own individual um, genes and genetics and environment. So it's really important that we never have this kind of blame, uh, you know, attitude towards it's never anybody's fault. If you're struggling with these kinds of things, uh, it is just more difficult for some people than others. Mm. That's a, it's an explanation and and a, sometimes an empowering kind of aspect. It's important not to shame shame yourself for that. And um, exactly, yeah. So. Lots of dietitians back in the 80s and 90s, you know, when I was kind of growing up was like, you know, always recommending a low fat diet. And, and that's obviously changed over the, over the um, preceding kind of decades. You know, now a lot of people are, are playing with, you know, good fats or keto diets, Mediterranean diets, et cetera. Is there still room for a low fat diet or, or is this kind of, is that out of fashion now? And should yeah, I think... I think the thing to remember mostly is that, yes, and I'm, this, you know, when I first trained as a dietitian, gosh, almost 30 years ago now, you know, it was very much then was all about low fat. 
And it's, 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 um, it might be helpful to kind of understand where that came from. The thought around the low fat diet was, was principally because fat has more than double the energy. That's why it's such a good energy source on our, on our body, because you can pack a lot of energy into a really small amount. We have extremely limited carbohydrate stores in the body because glycogen, the way that we store glucose in the body is a big bulky nutrient. It's stored with our, our, our uh, um, compound that's stored with lots of water. So every molecule of glycogen has three times as much water, which is a good thing because when we're exercising, we break down glycogen, we get this water release as well as getting the glucose uh, for energy but it means it's bulky and really hard to store whereas fat is extremely compact and it's got more than double the energy per gram compared to carbohydrate so the thinking around low fat was principally around um, uh, weight control and it was thought well you know this is the most energy dense part of the diet it makes sense to drop the fat because you'll get your calories or your kilojoules down and that's going to help with weight control and there were some very good studies from back then that showed that getting people to follow a low-fat diet did indeed help them to lose weight and we've still got those studies and mm. what's amazing to me is when we look at weight loss studies um, you know, the, the biggest conclusion of all the weight loss studies are you can do low carb and lose weight, you can do low fat and lose weight. The diet that works for you is the one you can stick to. <laughs> so that's the most important. Compliance is the most important factor. So some people find it much easier to stick to a low fat diet. Some people find it much easier to stick to a low carb diet. Mm. And, and there's a number of different ways. So the, the line that I kind of always use is, is that, um, you know, there's many different ways to eat healthily. And it's and there's, you know, unfortunately, there are also many ways to eat badly. But there's many ways to eat healthily. And we now are much more able to help people to understand what might be the best diet for them. And it's about fitting in with, yes, your genes, your metabolism, your lifestyle, how, how active you are. So someone who's extremely active, particularly with more higher intensity exercises, are probably going to do much better in a higher carbohydrate diet, where it's someone who's much, much more sedentary uh, might do much better on a low carb diet. And, and then there's a whole load of other sorts of variations, but your culture also matters. So, you know, a Mediterranean diet might suit those of you who have got that kind of background to enjoy those kinds of foods. But, you know, if you're from Asia, you might suit a much more Asian style diet that is very, very different. So that's where the sort of individualization comes back into play. And I would just encourage people to, yes, really think about the fats in your diet, making sure you've got the good fats, which are principally extra virgin olive oil, oily fish, nuts and seeds. Um, you know, these are the healthiest kind of fats, avocado, another really great, great um, high fat foods that we should. These are very healthful foods to be including. And the amount of them will vary depending on your individual makeup. Mm. It's so lovely to kind of hear that that broad based thing, because there's so much else about sort of palate and and just how you live your life. You know, I think there's you know, we, we're sort of so marketed to in terms of information that we kind of. It's almost penetrating. It's like, oh, I have to do that or I have to do that. Or, and we, we we kind of polarize things. It has to be one way or the other. It's so nice to kind of hear like, you know, our opinion matters, our style matters, what suits us matters. And listening to our own body is, is just so yes. important. I often I often use um, in one of my talks, I've got a kind of um, how to do personalized nutrition slide. And it's about how to build your diet. Mm. And it starts with the key foundation is the same for all of us. And that is basically a whole food diet with limiting or cutting out completely ultra processed foods. Mm. So that's the kind of basis. And from there, the layers over the top of that will depend on any medical conditions. If you've got allergies or food intolerances, uh, your gut microbiome makes a difference, your genetics, of course, your culture, your background, um, and then your likes and dislikes. So, you know, the example I always use is, you know, if you hate kale, you don't need to eat kale, you know, yeah. you can still have a healthy diet and choose different vegetables if that's, that's not right. your favorite thing. So yeah. I think it's really important we don't get hung up on, you know, diet becomes very, sometimes I think it's almost tribal, you know, yeah. um, my audible book, Food Fight, I called it Food Fight, Making Sense of the Diet Wars. And I talk about this a lot in that is when the diet becomes so tribal and almost mm. cult-like, cult you know, so people get really honed in into it's this way or no other way. And, you know, there's literally 40 thousand plus different diet books 
all professing to have the answer and have the diet that's optimal for the human race. And yeah. it's not true. You know, as humans, we're, we're, we're hugely adaptable to all sorts of different mm -hmm. types of diets. And, you know, your diet might be very, very different to mine for a number of different reasons, but they can both be extremely healthy, provided that they, they share that key foundation. Mm, I love that because, I mean, I, I heard one of my colleagues sort of saying like there is no essential foods, only essential nutrients. And, yeah. and so that's the kind of allows food to be, you know, what what is available, what's seasonal, what's, you know, organic, what do you like, how do you, you know, how do you cook it and all of these different kind of variables. It's so empowering to kind of think about diets in you know, what, what actually suits me and how can I do this for my body? And it brings the kind of power back to the, to the person really, rather than the rule book, um, you know, that we always feel like we have to kind of follow. So with, you know, there has been a big fad about keto diets and, you know, low carb and, and certainly a lot of the Vivaly, you know, team members are trying out various different diets and having a look at their glucose readings with regards to that and their, their likes and dislikes and their energy levels. What, what is the evidence saying about things like a keto diet? Because often when you see it, it's like that is, you know, the, the one diet that supports mitochondrial brain health or um, nervous system health. Like what is the evidence saying and does it suit everyone or should we, you know, I think I know what the answer is going to ask it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't do everyone. No, I, I would very much think of keto as a, as a therapeutic diet. Mm. Um, there is not a lot of evidence to suggest that it's a healthy diet for people. And we don't have long term evidence about what the impact of, of a keto diet is. And one of the reasons for that is that it's so bloody difficult to stick to. Mm. So when people say to me that they're doing keto, they say, I'm um, doing keto, Joe. And I then quit, ask a few really key questions about what they're doing. And almost invariably, they're not actually doing keto. They're, <laughs> they're just doing low carb and they're yeah. probably having a really high protein intake. Yeah. So if you let your protein come up too high, you're not actually in ketosis anymore because some proteins we can convert to glucose um, and, and that can be enough to kick you out of, of true ketosis. So I think it's worth remembering that this is there is a little bit of a fad around it. We've got some really good evidence, the strongest evidence, dietitians have used keto diets for particularly children with epilepsy um, for over 100 years. So it's not actually a new thing. Now, what's important to understand about its impact in the brain is, and it is being researched for people who have chronic migraines, for people with some different forms of dementia and so on. But when we use it therapeutically in that way, the theory is actually around those are in brains that are not functioning properly. So there's actually a disorder that seems to be impacting the brain cell's ability to be using glucose as fuel, which is the brain's preferred fuel source. So by upping the ketones, which is an alternative, it's a survival mechanism that the brain can then refer, start to use that as an alternative fuel source, which is really a, a survival mechanism for when we're starving, when we're going through a famine. So the theory is that in these brain disorders, where there's a disorder impacting the glucose utilization by brain cells, is then able to utilize these ketones, and then the brain starts to, to function um, more normally. So if that, if that theory is proven to be correct, then that suggests for those of us with healthy brains who don't have a problem using glucose as fuel for the brain, there, would, there, there isn't any evidence that, that, that following a keto diet would be beneficial for our brain health. So I think that's really important to remember. Um, the second thing is that there are some concerns over what keto does to the gut microbiome. So we know that there are some changes there because it's extremely difficult. Fiber is carbohydrate. Mm. Although we get, it's just carbohydrate that we can't break down with our own digestive enzymes. So the gut microbiome does it for us. So if you take out all carbs and you get to extremely low and most keto diets are somewhere like you know 15 or less, certainly less than 20 grams of carbs a day, you know, that's that's an extreme. It's really difficult to make your fiber work. Um, you get some fiber, yes, from things like nuts and seeds and from some of your low carb veggies, for example. But you're not getting the full diversity and range of of fibers. And unless you're then also taking fiber supplements, it can be really hard to, to get your fiber intake up. So that would be one thing I would suggest is it, and if you are following a keto diet, I would be taking a fiber supplement and preferably some different types of fiber. So that could be one way to try to overcome that. And then the last thing to think about then is whether, so there are also studies underway and we have some published studies suggesting that, you know, for, it, it might be a, a, a diet that 
can potentially help people who are extremely overweight, um, so who are in that sort of obese or morbidly obese category. But really, the research, to be honest, is, a is very underwhelming. It is mm -hmm. certainly not a magic bullet. Um, and because people find it so difficult to follow, especially long term, you know, when we when, when it's used therape therapeutically rather for those brain disorders, they tend to use supplements and special drinks and and ways of being able to to help people to follow the diet. Mm. So if you've got a lot of weight to lose, and um, it's an extremely difficult way to do it because it's hard to stay on that diet for a long time. So mm. I would tend to put that in the camp of a therapeutic diet. You can't, the other thing I find is people tell me, oh, I do keto a couple of days a week. No, that doesn't work either. <laughs> I'm afraid it takes a few days to get into true ketosis. So it's not possible to, to do it only a couple of days a week. So I suspect for most people, if they think they're doing it, they're probably just doing low carb. And there's mm -hmm. certainly an abundance of evidence, not to suggest that low carb is better than any other diet, but that it certainly can be more effective for some people. And again, it's coming down to that personal and it's, you know, it's your personal uh, likes and dislikes and, and what sort of a diet you find easiest to follow. But mm. certainly low carb is an option for some people. And I think too, I mean, you know, one of the one of the important things that I've often found with, you know, nutritional medicine is that there are therapeutic diets that are required when there's a disease process going in the body. So the body isn't working optimally and the diet can actually help to kind of reverse significant conditions. Like you mentioned, yeah. you know, in terms of a dysfunctional brain or a, you know, a condition... Mm particularly um, affecting the brain like epilepsy or something. And I think that's a really, you know, important distinction because that's often not a distinction that we make because often we think about, you know, diets, but, you know, like what diet should I have? You know, we're not actually talking about the underlying, um, I guess, metabolism or functionality of, of, the, um, of the body. And I think sometimes like using a therapeutic diet to see whether you can either, you know, fast track a kind of, you know, reshift the metabolism or reverse a type two diabetes or pre-diabetic state is, is really valid. But, you know, is that the, you know, do you have to stay on that particular strict diet, you know, um, once that condition has been reversed? These are all, you know, really good questions. But I wanted to to also, I, I don't want to miss out on the opportunity to talk about trans fats. You know, back in the US about five years ago, they banned trans fats and we have yet to ban them in Australia unless I've missed something in the, in the media over the last little while. But, you know, trans fats are a significantly damaged fat. Mm. Tell our audience a little bit about trans fats because I, I feel like once I kind of establish the knowledge of that it was easier to kind of I guess make decisions about certain foods knowing some of the damaging effects of of trans fats and what they actually do to to human health yeah so to understand what trans fats are what's important to recognize is that we we get almost no trans fats from natural whole foods mm. we get a little bit because they are sometimes made in 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 um you know, in the cow's stomach, for example, or so you get a little bit from some animal foods, but honestly, the amounts are absolutely minuscule. Mm. So most trans fats we're getting from ultra processed foods. And this is where, you know, it's usually some sort of, I hate the term vegetable oils, because it's actually a misnomer. We don't get oils from any vegetables. They're actually usually seed oils. But anyway, you know, if we think of those sort of common cooking oils, most of them are more unsaturated fats. Now, unsaturated fats are very unstable both in the body and particularly where there's lots of double bonds in the molecule. You're going to have to think back to your high school chemistry here and imagine a big long carbon chain with either they have single bonds or they have these double bonds. And where there's a double bond, that's an opportunity for the fat um, to be damaged. So what happens with trans fats are, and they're very, very fluid. So if there's lots of double bonds. These fats are usually oils because they're liquid at room temperature because these fats are highly mobile. Think of them like the branches of a tree. Whereas saturated fats don't have any double bonds and they're very, very straight. So they pack tightly together and that's why you'll get solid fats at room temperature are usually highly saturated. So think coconut oil or butter or lard, lots of saturated fats, they're keeping that all packed tightly close together. So when oils are used in food processing, they actually bombard the fats with hydrogen in order to break some of those double bonds and to make it act more like a saturated fat. So if you read in the ingredients list, the words hydrogenated oil, if you look for that hydrogenated word, that means this hyd hydrogen process has been done. So it's a chemical process, you know, in the factory that's that's created this oil to make it act more like a saturated fat. 
but it doesn't become a saturated fat. It's like these uh, uh, little parts in the molecule get flipped and that's why it's called trans. So it's a trans fat. So it's actually even worse for us. There is no doubt that high levels and, and even small levels of trans fats in our diet can be highly damaging. And that's why places like New York City, I think, was the first place in the world to actually ban them um, completely. And it's hard to know here in Australia how exposed we are to them. I think one of the reasons that they haven't officially been banned here in Australia is because I keep seeing, uh, you know, those who set these kind of recommendations and so on, stating, well, we have very low levels of saturated, of trans fat, sorry, in Australian diets at any rate. But, you know, I, I beg to ask the question about, are they actually being measured in every food? So we used to get a lot of them in margarines and the margarine manufacturers have got very smart about that and now have dropped their trans fat um, levels. So you'll often see on the packaging, zero trans fats. But actually, when you start measuring, we've done some studies, for example, measuring different oils, and we see, albeit low, they're under the, the official, you know, uh, 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 level that they have to be under, but they're still there in some of these highly processed oils um, that make up most of the oils in the supermarket shelf where you've got none in extra virgin olive oil. Mm -hmm. So that's just one example. So if you're eating a lot of these kinds of foods, or you're eating a lot of things like party pies and, you know, frozen pastry type products, those highly processed commercial type products then the numbers of these trans fats can really add up and might be having a significant impact on your on your health mm -hmm. but if you steer towards more whole foods and you go back to that foundation we talked about before of minimizing those ultra processed foods then you can rest assured that your trans fat intake is going to be low amazing um, so important to know, to know that, you know, ultra processed foods, because I mean, you know, if there was one rule. <laughs> yeah, like, I think that's the one we can agree on. Yes. <laughs> um, and, you know, so, I mean, as much as we all love, you know, what are the top three tips or whatever, it's like, don't have ultra processed food, don't have ultra processed food, don't have ultra processed food, you know, that yeah. can do the, the top three. But um, thank you so much. It's It's so good to have really a deep dive into into fat because you know even to this day it's still very um you know it's, it's kind of you know for for the people that are old enough you know it's it's almost like a it was such a strong strong mantra of how bad fat was for for your health for so many years um and I think still think people are affected by that so we're yeah I, that. I hear yeah. it all the time and I, I often talk about I think we've got a kind of hangover from the low fat era mm. and People start being scared about carbs. I mean, protein is mm. one macronutrient that seems to have escaped attack. Yeah. <laughs> but I often have to, you know, deal with people who are sort of scared to eat fat and scared to eat carbs. It's mm. like what's left. No, no. So I think, going, yeah. Yeah. I think the one thing that, that, that I always try to say to people is don't forget about the pleasure of food. You know, don't forget that food should be a joyous, wonderful, lovely, pleasurable part of our day. Mm. It's, it's partly what makes us human. You know, we're the only animal species that really has cuisine, you know, that we, <laughs> we put our creativity and our cooking skills into creating gorgeous meals. And we are very good at sharing it as part of our social connections. Yeah. So I think if we keep that at the heart also of a healthy diet should also be a really pleasurable, enjoyable one that celebrates your culture or other cultures. You know, I love to eat all sorts of different wonderful um, dishes and cuisines from around the world. And almost every country, if you look at their traditional cuisine, is healthy. You know, there's healthy foods in there. So I think if we keep that joy in food, then that is also something that will help us to follow that particular way of eating uh, yeah. for a lifetime. Yeah, it's our social, it's our social medicine, you know, in so many ways. Um, so I'll hand it back over to you, Charlotte, you know, to, to see whether anyone's got any questions. If anyone wants to shout out some questions for Joanna or myself, or we can have a discussion now for the next little while, how long we've got. Um, and over to you. Fantastic. So, Joe, I can't um, help myself. My dietitian hat is on at the moment. Um, and what I really liked you saying about this food matrix. So this is something that we spend a lot of time focusing on at Vively um, in terms of like balancing meals out and seeing how that has a big influence, particularly on metabolic health. Can we create that food matrix or is it just these particular foods that naturally have that occurring? Um, that's a really good question, Charlotte. You, uh, God, I could guess you're a dietitian. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, look, technically, when we when we look at the research studies, they're generally talking about the food matrix in a whole food. 
Um, but some of those foods are made. So cheese, for example, you know, we're, we're making cheese out with a fermentation process if it's proper cheese uh, from made from milk. So I suppose in that way, we're kind of creating that matrix. Um, I don't think it would be correct to call it the food matrix, but I could be wrong about this. But when we, but certainly fats will uh, act differently when they're part of a meal. So the example that's in my head is, of course, extra virgin olive oil again. But you know, we've got a lot of research there around the fact that when you pair extra virgin olive oil with vegetables, actually, what happens is you get some leakage of the antioxidant from the vegetables into the fat, because lots of, especially the polyphenols are fat soluble. So they come into the olive oil, the olive oil moves into the vegetables and actually what you end up getting are even some novel, uh, there's some changes to those particular um, chemicals and uh, new antioxidants are created in that process. But then you also get a greater absorption of, of all of them up into the body. So that's a really great example of how that kind of, I, I think technically I shouldn't call it a matrix, but certainly that food combination is potentially really, really important for our health. And it's thought to be one of, of the healthy aspects of, of um, the Mediterranean diet is the fact that veggies are, and other plant foods are paired with extra virgin olive oil. And there seems to be an even um, a, a, an added benefit when you cook them together. So that's you know something I'm always asked about. Is it okay to cook with extra virgin olive oil? Absolutely, yes. And in fact, we should be. So when you roast your veggies in oil or even when you're stir frying them in oil, that oil is actually helping us to absorb and utilize um, many of those uh, phytochemicals that are present. Mm. I love that example as well because um, I know like how things move into the oils like your garlic infused olive oil how that or onion infused olive oil how that doesn't impact someone say with a fructan um, malabsorption yeah. or IBS it's like the greatest inv invention not necessarily invention but the greatest way of being able to include those great benefits without having the gut disturbance that comes alongside it as well. Yeah, um, I know a lot of people with IBS have told me how excited they are to be able to get the taste of garlic. Yes, it's <laughs> with, the number one. Oh, from. I don't think I can go down that pathway, but you can get the flavour. Yes. <laughs> um, the other big, I guess, controversy, and this comes up in when I'm in practice all the time, is coconut oil. I would love, like I shy away from just these blanket statements because it's so everyone has quite a strong opinion around coconut oil. Um, and I guess this was something that was big when I was training. Um, so it was just starting to be um, really big. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on coconut oil as a whole. Well, the, the first thing to realize is that one, I, I often use it as an example when, when we're, you know, when we're talking with our marketing team at Cobram Estate. And I say, you know, the, the, whoever managed to do the marketing of coconut oil have done an amazingly brilliant job. But what to recognize is that the claims that are made around coconut oil are, are almost all of them grossly exaggerated and some are not true at all. So that's the first thing to, to say is to be very careful about some of those really, you know, when you see a, a, something that looks too good to be true, it probably is. And that's certainly the case when we look at something like coconut oil. On the other hand, saturated fats have often been unfairly demonized as if they're the, you know, as if they're sort of some toxic thing that's going to, it's going to kill us. So I think we have to be careful that the trick lies somewhere in the middle. I see coconut oil as being relatively neutral. It is a safe fat to cook with. It is stable to cook with because it's highly saturated. So it's very stable. It's not, it's not being oxidized and, and that's certainly a problem. So I would certainly use coconut oil over something like a refined seed oil. However, um, it lacks the polyphenols and it lacks the good fats. So we know that there's really important effects of things like monounsaturated fats. So even when you digest extra virgin olive oil, you create a compound called OEA, and that's a satiety factor that goes to your brain and helps you to eat less. Um, we know that monounsaturated fat is a very heart friendly fat. Uh, we know it's associated with less of that visceral fat that we talked about earlier. So they, these sort of qualities, and there's more than, I think we've got, we're up to 36 plus different polyphenols that have been identified in extra virgin olive oil. So when we look at coconut oil, uh, one is the major fat is almost, an, you know, the, the predominant fat is one called lauric acid. Mm -hmm. And I often see people saying that's a medium chain fat. And it's actually kind of on the cusp. It depends which biochemistry book you look at. Back in my day, our biochemistry book 
put it as the first of the long chain fats, where some of the more uh, more recent biochemistry books are putting it into the medium chain. So it's right on the border. And the truth is, it's got some characteristics of medium chain fats, and it's got some characteristics of long chain. So to say that it's a medium chain fat and to act like we've certainly got good studies, um, mostly coming from sports nutrition, around how the eight and 10 carbon chains, they're the true medium chain fats, are used much more readily as fuel. And that's why there was great interest in sports nutrition, you know, 20, 30 years ago, these were these medium chain fats were used as dietary supplements to see if that would improve athletic performance. And unfortunately, they weren't as effective as simply having carbohydrates. So sports nutrition kind of moved away from it. But the one that's in coconut oil is actually um, is a 12 chain carbon. So it's on that cusp. So you can't pull research out that uses the eight and 10 and say that it applies to coconut oil. So that's one really big difference. There are very, very small levels of medium chain and most of the positive research studies have actually used coconut oil that's been adapted to have much higher levels of the, of the true medium chain fats. And then that's been used as in, again, in therapeutic diets, um, particularly for those kind of ketogenic type diets where you might want to up the medium chain fats and get those particular effects. So it's not the coconut oil that you're buying off the shelf. So I would just, and if you have high cholesterol, I would definitely steer clear of coconut oil. So I've had lots of people come to me and say, oh God, Joe, my cholesterol went through the roof. And you ask them a question, they go, oh yeah, I've been using coconut oil every day. Take it out and the cholesterol comes back down. Now, not everyone reacts that way. If your cholesterol is fine and healthy and you love coconut oil, then go for it. That's fine. But you're not going to get the same health benefits as you will from a healthier fat like extra virgin olive oil. And we did just have um, someone ask as well, like, so the products that are labeled the MCT coconut oil, they're the ones that you've just mentioned, the ones that are sort of more they've been adapted they should have been adapted yeah they must have been adapted but i would be checking um i would be checking on the ingredients list or checking the ingredients to make sure that it actually is you know we we're, we don't have very tight we've got very tight um uh legislation around health claims that can be made on food products but unfortunately, particularly, and this is where I'll defend, often we're pointing the finger at big food companies and, and criticizing them. But actually, when it comes to what they get away with on pack, big companies don't because they'll immediately be you know, pulled to task and held to task if they're doing the wrong thing. But unfortunately, lots of small companies will slip through the net and say all sorts of outrageous things on their products um, that get so then they get away with it because they're small companies and nobody's really picking up on those kinds of things. So just be a little bit careful about what you read on pack i always go to the ingredients list and really try to to um uh, try to make sure i know exactly what's what's in the, the whatever the food product is i saw in the chat there someone i think was just asking about avocado oil and uh, that is another good fat that's a high monounsaturated um fat um and it's another good option it's just a really niche kind of a, a small industry but we do have some excellent avocado oil being made both in australia and in new zealand so that's certainly an, another option um, it doesn't, again, have the same sort of polyphenols and it doesn't have the abundance of research that we have around extra virgin olive oil. But we certainly know a lot about about avocados and having I certainly support having avocados as part of your diet because there's lots of great research about the benefits there of the whole food. And it's a healthy monounsaturated oil. Mm. And I guess one of the things that I've always been curious about as well is this distinction between the whole food fats versus like the see like the pressed fats and the oils that we get from it so would we be better off eating something like a whole avocado versus using avocado oil or is it like get little bits of everything um which tends to be the way as well but what are your thoughts about that yeah i think certainly with avocado when you have the whole food you're getting fiber you're getting a whole bunch of different nutrients you're getting a lot of folate you're you know there's a, there's the whole food package there so there's certainly benefits there to having the whole food um and, you know, it's a health that we do want to use oils because they become a medium for cooking, essentially, where I would say there's the difference. I know I'm incredibly, I keep banging on about extra virgin olive oil, but it, I do see it as being completely different to a lot of the other oils on the supermarket shelf. One, because it's essentially the juice of fresh olives. In comparison, when we look at you pick up something that's canola oil or, or rice bran oil, or it's just erroneously labeled vegetable oil, those oils actually have gone through a very industrial kind of refining process. So they have to use high heat, 
pressure, chemicals, sometimes all three, in order to make the oil. And it's gone through a refining process too. So that's a very, very different, and, it's, and they're new in the human diet in the last hundred or so years. Whereas something like extra virgin olive oil, um, or even things like coconut oil and even things like butter and animal tallow and so on. These are fats that have been around for, for centuries, if not thousands of years. You know, uh, extra virgin olive oil use can be tracked to, you know, um, way BCE, thousands of years BCE. So, you know, these are fats that have been around for a very long time and, and, and are much more natural. So I would use that. So I think there is something to be said for the whole foods like avocado, eating whole nuts and seeds. Um, eating the oily fish because you're getting more than the fat you're getting the other nutrients present and then when it comes to a cooking oil and for dressing and I, I sorry I meant to mention flavor as well so you know you'll find the only oils you'll find in my cupboard are extra virgin olive oil but you'll find lots of different flavor types so it's, it's again coming back to that idea of pleasure and cuisine so you know I'll use a different flavored type extra virgin olive oil depending on the particular dish that I'm trying to create so someone has just added to that. So which one would you recommend for salads? Like which extra virgin olive oil? Yeah, well, I would use this again comes down to the flavor, right? So if I've got a very delicate salad, like I've got iceberg lettuce or a, you know, really nice soft butter sort of lettuce, I'm not going to want a really strong flavored extra virgin olive oil because it might overpower it. So I might use one of the more delicate kind of flavored olive oils in that case. But if I've got radicchio and rocket and spinach or kale or any of those more robust kind of greens, or I want to pair my oil with a balsamic vinegar or something that's quite a strong taste, then I'm going to use one of my much more robust oils. Um, and they also tend to have higher levels of polyphenols. The taste, that peppery taste you get in the back of your throat is actually coming from uh, one, one in particular of, of those polyphenols. So I kind of, I, I have to confess, I tend to lean more because I love the flavor of extra virgin olive oil. And so I, I do tend to lean to a lot of those more robust type flavors. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, pair it up and depends, you know, a, a same thing if I'm using a delicate fish or if I'm, you know, if I do quite often, I do like a crumbed and fried fish. Uh, for, my, for my, I've got two teenage boys, so it's one of their favorite dishes, then I'm going to use my, my kind of more lighter flavored oils to do that frying. Whereas if I'm doing red meat and it's a marinade or I've got an oily fish or I've got something that's much more robust and strong flavored, then I'm going to use my more robust oils. That's kind of the best guide. Mm -hmm. Nice. It's so interesting that you said um, frying because this has been something, again, I get questioned about constantly. You can't possibly cook with olive oil. That's your salad oil um, because of the smoke point. That's not true, though, is it? It's not. No, and we've got very good scientific evidence now to, to show exactly what happens when we heat different oils. Um, and we see what happens when we heat them to high temperature. So uh, in, in the, the Cobram labs, which have independent international labs, um, and they test all sorts of different oils in that lab, not just, not just Cobram oils. Um, what we see very clearly in the comparison, and these were heating the oils up to 240 degrees C, which is much higher than any of your home cooking um, preparation type things. And then looked also at what happens to the oils over six hours. The smoke point gives you very little indication of how the oil is actually going to behave. Um, so the smoke point is, is almost not even worth looking at. What we need to understand is, and when we look at those comparisons, the oils that tell us in their marketing that they're great for frying, like canola and rice bran and sunflower, they actually performed the worst. So they broke down and started releasing, you know, creating these sort of toxic uh, compounds much more readily. And the safest oil, extra virgin olive oil. And coconut oil also came out very, very well because it's a saturated fat. As soon as you've got a saturated fat, it's stable um, at high heat. It's not going to oxidize. But the extra virgin olive oil is also protected. One, because it's monounsaturated fat, which is a lot more stable than polyunsaturated fat. But secondly, actually, the vitamin E and the polyphenols are protecting the oil as it heats. So in fact, it lasts really, really well. Um, and we get, remember that benefit I talked before about when you cook veggies in your extra virgin olive oil. So the, the message is very, very clear. Not only can we, we should be cooking with our extra virgin olive oil, using it to fry our fish, to use it in marinades for your meats that you're going to put on the barbecue. And then you're going to get the benefit of the polyphenols, but the polyphenols will also protect the oil during that cooking process. Mm. It's amazing how the research has caught up because like in just 10 yeah. years since I had my lectures on which oils to cook in, uh, rice bran oil was yeah. the, the one to recommend. And yeah, I certainly wouldn't be going for that one. 
now in those uh, yeah and i sh- look i should point out other dietitians i i know plenty of dietitians who still say use unsaturated fats and so you know you it just takes a long time for this sort of information to filter through and for people to really understand where the science is and i know it can be really confusing for people that the science changes but what i always remind i'm sure michelle you'll back me up here if we look at medicine look at how medicine's changed and we all accept that medicine moves on and we find better treatments and better approaches and the research moves on with nutrition science it's still a relatively young science we only discovered all the vitamins and minerals and so on in the last century or so so it's worthwhile just understanding that it is a young science we don't know everything yet we're still understanding more and when new research comes out Occasionally it throws completely out some, but it doesn't normally, it normally builds. We normally just haven't understood all the nuances. So the idea of of lowering your saturated fat to help heart health wasn't necessarily wrong. It was just that we didn't understand the nuances that, you know, the food matrix, for example, or the impacts of different foods or food combinations. You know, diet is incredibly complicated. And when you change one thing, you change something else. Food is complex. You know, one of one of my very first research studies when I first graduated from my Bachelor of Science was was looking at broccoli and I was identifying antioxidants in broccoli. And that was one vegetable and there was loads of them, you know. So I think when you understand that and understand the complexities, then that helps to shed light on the fact that we shouldn't throw out everything we knew before. We have to build on it and accept that new research and not think, you know, oh, well, you know, it doesn't matter what you eat. Someone says that was bad and now it's good. And so don't get confused by all of that. Just understand that the science is moving on. And I think nutrition science is one of the hardest to study because there are so many factors that we we don't even know about, like microbiome, like how that influences. Yeah. So our, our sample sizes in themselves aren't necessarily representative of a population um, either. And that's something yeah. like when you do see those claims of like you must go with coconut oil, for example, it's like, in what population was that studied or like to really find that nitty gritty, which is what I, I do love about Vively, for example, we are using that ability to for that individualised nutrition, which seems to be hmm. the, the next big thing in nutrition, which is amazing as well, like what you can look at in terms of your genetics, like you mentioned. And um, I, I do, I want to know more about the genetic tests um, available hmm. for understanding like fat metabolism and, and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so well, the, the, the test that I did before was from a company called Nutrigenomics, who are a, a Canadian company, but they're available here in Australia only through practitioners. I think originally it was only available through dietitians, but I think now some doctors and other healthcare professionals are doing it. And so I was very supportive of that. I'm actually just about, my, my test kit just arrived today. I'm testing a new genetic company um, who are an American company who want me to, to be involved in potentially launching here in Australia. Um, so I'm, I'm t- investigating that. What I would say about gene testing is the reason I like nutrigenomics and this new test that I'm, I'm, I'm trialing is that it's very much focusing on the genes that influence either diet or lifestyle or some sort of thing that we can do something about. It's not about looking at genes and telling you, oh, you're going to get breast cancer, or you're going to get heart disease, or you're going to get this. I, you know, I think we've got to be extremely careful with the interpretation of what some of these genes uh, gene tests are saying. So nutrigenomics is good because you can't just send your sample off and get your own result. You have to discuss it with your healthcare professional who can help you to understand what this means for you. And it's all about positive changes. It's not about scaring you with some sort of, you know, scary genetic things. And, and we've got to be, of course, very, very, um, you know, it's sensitive information, some of this healthcare information in particular. So there's been a lot of discussion around what's the security. You know, the last thing you want is your health insurance, for example, getting hold of information that suggests you're at high risk of, of particular diseases. So, so I'm very, very cautious about that. But where there's a very positive outcome in terms of understanding, um, so nutrigenomics will be able to tell you whether or not, and I'm not financially involved with this company at all, by the way, but um, it, it will very, very much tell you, you know, whether or not salt is likely to raise your blood pressure over time, whether you should be particularly careful. It doesn't dramatically change the dietary guidelines, but it will suggest you should probably a bit, be a bit more careful with salt. It will tell you whether you're a fast or slow caffeine metabolizer um, and whether that might be something that you really need to pay attention to. It will tell you about your metabolism of fat. So some people will be more sensitive to the 
the to the potential detrimental effects of saturated fats whereas for other people it's less important the omega-3s that i mentioned whether or not you're good at making those long chain omega-3s that gene variant has been identified and so it will tell you about that so and there's a whole load of different ones i think they're up to you know 80 odd genes now that that they look at so it really uh, the thing that I find, and I've done it, you know, I've, I've, I've helped other people go through that particular test. And what I find is it improves their motivation to make particular changes because they know that change is particularly important for me. So there's things that we can identify from those gene tests that allow you to tweak your diet a little bit more. So I can see us in the future getting to a point where, you know, you can have your genes tested, you can have your microbiome tested, you do as you're doing here at, at, at Vively with your continuous glucose monitor. You know, I did that relatively recently to have a look at your app, as you know, and um, and even for me, I was it was really insightful to, to wear a continuous glucose monitor. Those, you know, they, they didn't used to be available to us. It used to be incredibly difficult to measure your blood glucose. When I was doing my PhD, I had to have people in the lab for 10 hours and I had to prick their fingers every 15 minutes. It was not, it was not a nice day to spend in the lab having to have your fingers bled every 15 minutes for me to be able to see what happened over the course of 10 hours and eating different diets. So, you know, this it's an absolute game changer to be able to, and, and that's, I think, the, you know, as we move forward, that's what's going to happen, that you're going to have a much greater ability to personalize your diet with all of that information combined into one spot. Um, and, and that will really help uh, you to, to hone in on exactly your differences. And the other thing to bear in mind is that, you know, your gut microbiome is just one example. That influences your blood glucose control. So, you know, if you change your diet and you make adaptations to your gut microbiome over time, you might not be getting the same blood glucose responses from the same foods and meals. So I think that's why it's, it is advantageous to at least be doing, you know, once every, what do you say, every three months? Is it four times a year you're recommending? Yeah, they do. And that's why it's important to come back and do it again, because if you've made adaptations to your diet and lifestyle, you might well have changes. Um, and it's, it's like a little double check to make sure that you're really staying well within range. Just like you'd get your cholesterol checked every three months. I think it's good to do these little okay. checks and see. And like you said, that um, that feedback to know that you're on the right track and how it is influencing you as an individual. Yeah, I think is really cool. Um, but Joanna, thank you so much. That's all we've got time for tonight. There was so much fantastic information. I, I really appreciate it. And I, I could talk Good. more. Oh, it looks like Michelle might have another. I've just got someone at the door. Just oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, So oh, I wanted to quickly mention as well, very timely, you have got an Audible series on heart health. Um, I've listened to a number of the ones that you've done in the, over the years and definitely recommend checking out the heart health one, particularly around um, yeah, what we've spoken about today. I'm sure there'll be lots of information around yeah. facts on that. Um, we'll post um, a link to that as well, that link in our Facebook community. Um, for anyone that couldn't make it, um, we'll email through the, um, the link for the recording. Um, but I just want to say a massive thank you, Joanna, and to Michelle. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's just amazing to share this information and learn so much. Um, our next one that we've got in August, we'll be looking at carbohydrates um, in a little bit more detail with Dr. Jessica Turton as well. So that's really exciting. Um, and that will be emailed out in a couple of weeks. But thank you all for your time. Um, have a wonderful much. evening and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.